In recent years, there is great interest in the U.S. and other parts of the world on the use of cover crops as part of their cropping systems. Cover crops are also gaining popularity in the vegetable production systems of California. Cover crops are known to provide a multitude of benefits to agriculture, particularly to soil quality. But what is a cover crop? A cover crop, by definition, is a crop planted primarily to manage soil erosion, soil fertility, soil quality, water, weeds, pests, diseases, biodiversity, and wildlife in an agro-ecosystem. Today, we're visiting with Dr. Eric Brennan, who is a research scientist with the USDA ARS in Salinas, California, to learn more about the importance of cover crops. The way I think of them as they're the crop that you grow to improve the soil and provide a lot of other benefits. Things like uh, reducing nitrate leaching into our groundwater, uh, adding organic matter back to the soil, um, improving the infiltration of water, uh, reducing soil erosion, changing various aspects of soil health, like um, some of the microbial community shifts can happen with cover crops. Um, they can also help us to uh, recycle nutrients that are left over from a previous crop into the next year's crop. So for example, in Salinas Valley where we grow a lot of vegetables, uh, if we didn't have a cover crop in this field, the nutrients that were left from our previous crop, let's just say it was broccoli in this case, those would have been very susceptible to leaching during the winter when it was raining. And uh, that, not, that nitrogen especially would have gone back, gone down into our aquifer and contaminated our aquifer with nitrogen. And um, when we grow a cover crop like this rye, so this is a rye cover crop, um, it's got a really extensive root system and it can pick up nitrogen and hold that nitrogen in its biomass. And then when we, when we mow it down and then work that into the soil, that can be recycled back into our next crop. Um, we also actually have, uh, this is a, a rye vetch mixture, so this is purple vetch, and the, the, the rye is just recycling nitrogen that was left over, but the vetch, through biological nitrogen fixation, can actually take nitrogen out of the air and put it into the through a, through a symbiotic relationship, put it into the legume, and then that can actually add nitrogen to the field through that um, symbiotic process. Dr. Brennan explains there are several different types of cover crops used in vegetable production systems in California. So in, in these systems, uh, in Salinas, there's sort of two, two major groups of cover crops that we would use. They would be generally a cereal or a non-legume cover crop, like rye, like this. Um, another another non-legume that's used commonly here is mustard. There's several different types of mustard. And then the other group would be uh, the, the legumes like vetch or fava bean or peas. Uh, one other non-legume that we have done some work with is um, buckwheat. But that, that's more of a, a warm season cover crop. With a large variety of cover crops, it can be difficult selecting a cover crop. When I select a cover crop, what I'm really looking at, um, well, a few things. Do I have access to the seed? Is the seed of reasonable cost and in, a, in enough quantity that I can plant it at a high enough seeding rate to uh, have the cover crop grow well as well as suppress weeds? That's, that's a big one. Um, is the cover crop suitable for the climate? So in, in this case, uh, we know that rye is a very uh, winter hardy cover crop, so is the vetch, and that, that grows well in our system. Um, some other issues would be, what kind of benefits do you want to see in the subsequent crop? So just say I was growing a um, uh, well, broccoli crop here next. If I want to get a lot of nitrogen uh, scavenged as well as fixed, then having a legume cereal mixture might be a good fit for this system. Um, you also should, of course, think about what the previous crop was. So just say I came out of this and I had planted, um, so let's just say the, the next crop is lettuce and the previous crop was broccoli. Broccoli tends to leave a lot of the nutrient that you added to the broccoli crop in the soil after you've taken that broccoli crop down. And so you want a really good scavenger. 
you want something like a cereal like this rye that can get in there and scavenge that nitrogen so that it can be recycled back to the next crop. Let's just say you planted vetch or fava bean or peas instead of a, a non-legume following broccoli. The problem with that would be that uh, legumes tend not to be good scavengers of nitrogen. And so you probably could have a lot of nitrate leaching even with a, um, with a legume cover crop after a very high nitrogen input vegetable crop. Um, another thing that's kind of important with cover crop selection is uh, what's your weed situation like in the field? And how are you going to control those weeds? So planting a cover crop, we often think about all the good things that can happen, like adding soil organic matter and suppressing erosion and you know, doing all those things that we kind of uh, associate with positive things, but cover crops can also create some real problems if they're not um, planted right and managed right. And our research here has shown that one of the biggest problems has to do with weed growth during the cover crop. So if you don't have a, a cover crop that's weed suppressive, you're going to possibly be adding a huge amount of weed seed to that soil uh, weed seed bank, and that's going to haunt you in your next vegetable crops. So I always tell growers that's what probably one of the most important things is how is your cover crop that you've selected going to suppress weeds? Uh, sometimes we can plant a cover crop like Ryan and it does a really good job of suppressing them just through competition. But there's other ways to also suppress weeds. Like in this cover crop, um, this is actually cover crops planted on beds. So we planted these just like we would plant a vegetable on, with two lines on a 40 inch bed. And we actually came in and cultivated our cover crop to cultivate out the weeds just like we would cultivate the weeds out of a vegetable crop. So we're relying on um, mechanical weed control in that case, and that that's kind of gives us, gives us a few more options. What is the quality of the residue that you're producing going to be like? If you want a cover crop that's going to decompose really quickly prior to your next crop, you want to make sure that it's got enough nitrogen in it, that the carbon to nitrogen ratio is not really high because if the carbon to nitrogen ratio is really high then the cover crop will decompose slowly and that can create some problems with your next vegetable so you know that's why we tend to like mixtures it keeps this carbon to nitrogen ratio somewhere down around say 20 or so and that tends to decompose relatively well and not immobilize a lot of nitrogen for before your next vegetable once the cover crop is selected the next step is seeding. So the way that we seeded this cover crop was we actually used a modified vegetable seeder. That, that's kind of an, an unusual way to plant a cover crop though. Normally cover crops are not planted on beds like here. Uh, at least in the Salinas Valley. Normally they would be planted on a field without beds and we'd use a grain drill. You use more seed with that uh, and it's also you don't have as many options for managing weeds. Cover crops can also be seeded with a hand seeder in small plots. There are many important things to consider for cover crop management. Yeah, so management of the cover crop, um, probably the most important thing is plant it at an optimal seeding rate. And by optimal, I mean a seeding rate that will give you, remember that first thing, weed suppression, good weed suppression, and, and a good stand. Once you've got it planted right, Hopefully you can get rain that will germ germinate it up without having to irrigate it. There's a lot that goes into that decision. To have a successful cover crop, it is important to have a good stand to suppress the weeds. Termination is another vital practice with cover crops. So the way that we terminate the cover crops typically would be we'd come in with a flail mower, which, uh, you know, it's got these uh, rotating, this rotating bar or, or tube which has got these very sharp knives on there and those uh, cut down the cover crop as low to the ground as possible and also hopefully um, in small pieces. Once that's done uh, we would then come in with our spader and we would very intensively till in all that material um, and then 
wait a, wait a few weeks and then get this field bedded up for the next vegetable. In organic production systems, the cover crops are rolled or flail mowed, thus leaving a thick residue on the soil surface. However, in conventional cropping systems, the cover crop is killed with a broad spectrum herbicide. And then the next crop is either planted or transplanted using a strip tiller or a no-till transplanter. So what are the benefits of cover crops? Probably the first thing that a farmer could see in terms of a benefit would be, did the cover crop reduce some problems that you commonly would have without a cover crop? Visual problems, like did it reduce erosion? Did it reduce runoff from the field? Um, that's a very obvious benefit that you can see right away. Um, so that's an easy one. Uh, another way to, another easy one, relatively easy one to see would be, has the cover crop provided services for other aspects of your system, say um, beneficial insects? So a good example of that would be uh, a few weeks ago when I was in this cover crop and I was taking some biomass samples, there were lady beetles, about several of them every single meter of this bed. And those lady beetles eat aphids, which are on our strawberries and on our vegetables. So without a cover crop here, those lady beetles wouldn't have any kind of habitat to hang out in. They don't want to hang out in a bare field. But what can work really well with a cover crop is if the cover crop has got aphids on it that are different than the aphids that would normally go in your vegetables, the lady beetles have a food source which can tie them over until they would then be going and looking for aphids in your vegetables or your economic crops. So that's, that's one way to see another benefit. So they would be providing benefits in terms of um, biological control services. Um, another obvious benefit that you could quantify would be how does it affect your, ne your next vegetable's yield? And um, in our long-term study, we've, we've been measuring yield. And what we find is with the same fertilizer inputs, a cover crop can often increase the yield of a vegetable by several fold. So, and that's because the cover crop is recycling nutrients, excuse me, back into the, the, the next vegetable. So yield benefits um, tend to be relatively obvious and easy to see, especially if you're not over fertilizing. Um, some of the more subtle benefits like changes in soil organic matter or changes in uh, the microbial community in the soil, those take more time to see often. Knowing when to plant a vegetable crop after the termination of a cover crop can vary greatly. If you transplant the next vegetable, it's much easier than if you plant the next vegetable from seed. So in our long-term systems study, we have always transplanted two vegetables after our cover crops. And the reason I like transplanting rather than going from seed is that I don't have to worry about all this residue. Uh, you know, lettuce seed's very small even when it's pelleted. Broccoli seed is small also. And it can have problems when it's trying to emerge through a bunch of what growers here call trash. It's, it's kind of ironic, but people call this, I consider this gold but it's also considered trash in a sense that uh, there's a lot of stuff in the field that gets in the way of our vegetable seedlings trying to emerge. So if you don't have to deal with that issue, you can just go from transplants, it makes it a lot easier. Typically for, uh, just say we work this cover crop down and then we wanted to plant a month later, that would be possible. If you were going from seed, you may have to wait a little bit longer. Um, you also may, might not want that cover crop to get as big if you were going, going from seed. Now another issue that's probably important to keep in mind though is different cover crops are different in that way. For example, if you had a mustard cover crop here, the growers in our area often say mustard mows down or goes down just like butter. It's easy. It's, it, you, you can mow it and then you can work the beds and there's not a lot of trash or residue left. Whereas rye, this rye cover crop, tends to leave a lot of stuff that's still visible on the surface. So 
If you did have to plant a vegetable, it's probably easier to plant into mustard with seed than it would be to say plant into rye. Um, so just a summary then, usually at least a month we wait after mowing down and incorporating the cover crop because we need to have that decompose and then start to, to get it to where we can have our planter or our, our seeder go through there, our transplanter. Some vegetables are better suited for cover crop systems. The more challenging ones to follow a cover crop would be, say, baby mix, spring mix. You know, something like uh, spinach planted in a high density or the baby lettuces. Uh, those would be tough to follow a cover crop. And the reason for that is those are all planted by seed. They're all planted with seed that is not pelleted, so it's very small seed. Uh, they've got to be planted, you know, about that deep. And so there's not a lot of tolerance for this stuff sticking on top there. And the other challenge with planting a baby mix right after a, uh, a cover crop would be most of those baby mixes are mechanically harvested. And what the harvesters don't want is a bunch of stuff like this sticking up when they come in to mow off that or harvest off that, um, that baby mix because this will go up with the harvested material and that's just not a good situation. So uh, crops that would work well would be things like romaine lettuce, broccoli, um, th things that where we, where we harvest them manually tend to be better following a, a cover crop than things that would be mechanically harvested for uh, when they're really small. There are some new innovations being seen in cover crop systems in California. This here is a good example of one of them, planting cover crops on beds. Um, not a lot of this is, is done yet, but I think it's got a lot of potential because we can plant the cover crop at a much lower seeding rate, so we can save, we can save uh, seeding costs. We can mechanically cultivate the cover crop to take out weeds. Uh, because the cover crop is on beds, we can also possibly mow it better. Another sort of innovative approach that we're working on here is planting cover crops in furrow bottoms of plastic mulch covered strawberry beds. Um, and that's, that's kind of a neat system because that allows us to minimize uh, runoff and soil erosion from those plastic mulch covered beds during you know, winter rains. Like other systems, there are some major challenges in using cover crops in vegetable production systems. Probably one of the biggest disadvantages or challenges, I'll say, is it's a more complicated way to grow vegetables. It's a better way to grow them, I think. I think the data clearly shows that, but you've got to be a better grower. You've got to be able to manage things well. Um, I, I wish I had brought with me my juggling balls because what I would do is I'd take out those juggling balls, three balls, and I would juggle for you and I'd say basically, when you're growing two vegetables a year, which is typical in the Salinas Valley, you've got two hands. It's not very hard to juggle two balls. Adding a third ball is like um, adding a cover crop to that system. You've only got two hands, you've got three balls. One's got to be in the air all the time. You've got to be a much better grower. You've got to be able to juggle those three different things. And you're going to make mistakes. Guaranteed you're going to make mistakes. But if you practice, and there's a, I have a video that's titled Cover Cropping is Like Juggling. If you practice, you'll get better at it. Um, so difficulties, challenges, disadvantages, it's more complicated. But there's so many benefits. I wouldn't, from what I've seen, how a cover crop can change our soil systems, I wouldn't want to grow vegetables without cover crops. But I, I realize you've got to really, you've got to focus on the cover crop. You've got to really pay attention to what's it doing. Uh, what are its needs? What are you doing wrong? How can you make it work better? It's a, it's a learning process, uh, but it's a fun one. Um, and uh, it's something that I see one of the biggest parts of my job is to do research on cover crops, but also help growers uh, learn how to cover crop better. And 
we make lots of mistakes here and I try to share those mistakes uh, as well as our successes so that other people can hopefully learn from those and, and use them in their systems also. So you can check out some of those videos there. If you go to the YouTube, just go and type in uh, Brennan, my last name, B-R-E-N-N-A-N, Organic, and there's a YouTube channel that has several different videos that I've made. More information on cover crops can be found in the University of California's Cover Cropping for Vegetable Production, a Grower's Handbook.